My name is Philip Allen, Director of Learning at the BBA, and today for the next hour to discuss the seven practical steps towards mastering conduct risk, I'm joined by presenters Simon Hills, BBA's Executive Director of Prudential Risk and Regulation, Trevor Jones, Managing Director, Financial Services Risk of Barclay Research Group, and Dr. Roger Miles, Managing Director. So there are five points which we'd like to speak to over the next half an hour or so. Uh, and these are questions which are raised really with people that we're hearing, you know, talking to in the conduct space, CROs, uh, finance directors and compliance people um, all the time. One of the benefits of being a researcher is that you can invite people to talk to you and uh, share their concerns and so we will um, reflect those back to you. Um, first question which always comes up is what does the regulator really want? You know, it's all very well the published information and the speeches and the, and the uh, conduct risk outlook, uh, you know, mission statements and so on. What does it mean in practice? We will talk to that. Uh, next up, what, is the, uh, what are the conduct prosecution hotspots now into the next year? People are very much concerned that uh, there may be stuff happening today which is not the direction of where the prosecutor is going to go in the next uh, accounting term. What will best practice good behavior look like now and in the future? We hear a lot of people saying good behavior is asked for, but we don't know what it looks like specifically. How can we better plan for the costs of compliance? As somebody was saying at a, at a, a session I was briefing earlier this morning, uh, what is my return on compliance spend, the ROC indicator, which we've just invented, but you know, that's something worth perhaps thinking about. And finally, um, beyond costs, what are the best new tools for predicting and managing conduct risk? That is something which as researchers we get a lot of exposure to, and I'm very happy to summarize some of the best thinking that's currently out there globally on uh, predicting and managing. But no. Roger, what, what do you think the conduct regulator really expects for us to address the first? The first uh, right, let's, but let's, uh, absolutely, let's jump in with this question of expectation. I think it's necessary to understand this from two points of view. Uh, and these are, you can look at the behavioral agenda of the conduct regulator. So what's going on uh, in terms of understanding uh, the cognition of risk, to use my term, but to use a slightly less scary term, behavioral risk or, or conduct risk as humans interacting. Well, the regulator has set out their stall as a behavioral regulator. What that means is they've read a lot of the latest behavioral research into, uh, you know, hidden agendas people have, into gaming of regulation, into uh, non-verbal signals and so on, but in, in, in essence it's understanding the, the impact of biases and asymmetries of information on the sales process. Um, the regulator is also, in, in the course of doing this, absorbing new information from uh, information sources such as the ombudsman, uh, consumer groups, social media, and of course there's always the political question in the background of, you know, any regulator has to keep their political masters happy. Therefore, anything which occurs in, let's call it, the voter space, you know, the politically sensitive space, uh, anything that goes catastrophically wrong in, in causing a public uh, crisis of confidence is naturally of interest and will be ushered into the, the conduct space. Then there's also, let's call it, the more conventional kind of regulatory enterprise. Um, and I'd like to ask my, my colleague Trevor to perhaps talk to uh, those points. What is the regulator's, as it were, standing agenda which they have to keep uh, members happy on. Thank you, Roger. Um, I guess it's easy to say that the regulator's objectives um, are the same thing as their expectations. So what really matters to them at a very high level, uh, obviously that we maintain a fair market. Uh, we haven't had that uh, at all times. That the organizations are stable, that means particularly in terms of capital and liquidity in the light of the credit crunch. We don't want to relive that again. And some of those things like responsible lending. And above all, I think really for the SCA, it's a fair treatment of customers and ensuring there's no customer detriment. In fact, as they would say, put the customer's needs ahead of profit considerations. So people often ask us, uh in the course of talking to people, what, you know, what does this mean in practice? What are the do's and don'ts, if you like? What's the list of, of things to do and things not to do? So let's give you a short list of those yes. to start with. Yes, well, <clears throat> the manipulation of the market um, with FX and LIBOR, the, this, these are all the not to do things. Um, <clears throat> ensure that your systems and controls are not fragile. 
and, and go from the top to the bottom so the policy becomes the processes, the procedures, and then the controls. And make sure the controls are all joined up and tested. Um, and part of that is also having a very effective three lines of defense. Um, anticipate well in terms of products. So when producing new products and taking them to market, think of the customer very much um, in terms of the customer's life journey in that product. And then when it's being uh, advised or non-advised, um, ensure that that's done very well either by your organization or by um, brokers. Remember, of course, you can outsource activity but not responsibility. And I think even if the brokers are regulated in their own right, uh, have a, we have a responsibility to ensure they understand their products really well. We're hearing words from the regulator that, that are sort of critical. The, the, the thing is to listen for the music of, of what they're saying. So words like short-termist products or disconnected, implying that there's a, a gap between the provider and the customer's real need, uh, and early revenue, which is, a, again, kind of regulator code for products which have a fat front-end uh, commission uh, and then kind of leave the customer, as it were, swinging in the wind uh, you know, while the contract runs out. Uh, so listening for the language that the regulator uses is quite a good steer on this. In terms of the, the what to do's, um, TCF is, is not fading away. I've heard people speak of, well, it's, it's less important now, conduct risk uh, covers everything. But TCF remains as important as it ever was. Um, and in terms of the behaviors of individuals, ensure you hire the right people in the first place, and that means in terms of their fitness and properness and their attitude. <clears throat> and of course, in that regard, I'm, I'm just today, in fact, finalizing our response to the FCA, FCA and the PRA, who've got a consultation out on regulatory references, and there's going to be a much greater responsibility on us in the future to collect and use uh, references from people before uh, they actually join the organization. And then if we find out that something in that reference is wrong later on in the day, we've got to pass that information on to the new employer. Indeed, the senior management responsibilities are that there should be full and frank referencing and certification handover when, when one leaves a role. Having <coughs> recruited the people that have the integrity, the right mindset, and it's, it's the regulators partly silent on this in terms of senior management responsibilities. That's a skill and competence. But you don't want just ignorant, right-minded people. So it's not fair to them. So ensure they understand, upskill them, invest in, in, in their skill and competence. And ensure that it, everything that you see has a customer centricity to it. It's very important to be able to evidence customer centricity. And that's how to also by turn from the top um, or turn from the top to the tail, you know. I'm going to talk about tone from the top a little later. Yes, that can be a, a blind alley, actually. We need to be careful with this. Uh, and oversight of control. I, um, I know there are a number of situations where, in the past, uh, things have gone sadly wrong because the oversight wasn't uh, effective. <clears throat> and so one must have a very clear line of sight, and particularly for material outsourcing. Once you've outsourced something, you put the risk up. Just by the outsourcing, you've increased the risk. And if maybe you send that geographically a long way from where you operate, maybe in a different culture, be alive to the risks of that and ensure you've got unfettered line of sight. And that's from the board throughout the organization. Now, I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, control design tracks because it seems to me uh, around the town I hear a lot that people are applying sort of off risk methodology to conduct risk. And although operational risk can help in many ways to, to control kind of routines of behavior, it's not necessarily the best mechanism to employ for changing attitudes. Uh, and I'd like to just challenge a couple of misconceptions that, that are often talked about. The first of these is this phrase, conduct risk appetite, which I hear uh, advocated, and indeed I attended a very good talk by a law firm last week on you know, the necessity for conduct risk appetite modeling. Um, I don't disagree. It, the, the idea of risk appetite is a useful thing to have in play. But if you actually translate the phrase conduct risk appetite literally, um, it could be taken to mean pricing customer abuse into the product. Yes. Or as it were, charging the customers for mis-selling to them, which I'm sure is not what the regulator intended as the consequence of, of this approach. And so we need to maybe drill into it a little and question, uh, you know, is it actually what was meant? The answer, of course, is no. Uh, we have to interpret it a little differently and to, to model it a little differently. It can be a trick question, can't it? So if you ask um, someone, what's your 
kind of risk appetite, and they say 5%, that means you have a preparedness to disadvantage 5% of your customer base, potentially, if you take it to that level. It, it's just a trick question. I think it can only be zero. Well, of course, there, there is a fair point that, you know, at, at any given time, 5% of, you know, new products in play or sales people being trained or, you know, so some slack. But, I mean, to call that a, a, a risk appetite, I think it's simply an I unhelpful label. I, I agree. So, the, one will have measures that are more to do with uh, tolerance and appetite is almost the wrong word. Yes, I think it's, I think it's more kind of the use of concept and language that's at fault here, not the intention behind it so much. Second one is turn at the top, and I'm, I'm quite fierce as a critic of, of this, and I'm happy to say that some research colleagues in Australia published a report earlier in the year which gave the lie to the idea that turn at the top is an effective uh, way of curing any conduct uh, problems. Tone at the top, of course, is necessary, and it's, it's good to have a board that is putting out positive ethical signals. Um, but the, the point here is it doesn't work on its own, and more particularly that it is not a sound indicator of compliance attitudes and ethics throughout the organization. Uh, indeed, it's a bit of a blind alley, uh, but very often traders or salespeople will almost look at what the board is saying and say, yes, that doesn't really apply to us. Um, the WAH is our shorthand for the what actually happens test, you know, what people do when you present them. Uh, with the, uh, the fact of having to comply with something which then conflicts with their sales targets, then very often they'll go with the sales target rather than the difficult business of, of you know, behaving ethically. Uh, so tone at the top on its own is the point. It, it's not enough. You need to look at tone at the till, as the regulator recently said, and more particularly how middle management filter uh, general sort of risk uh, uh, risk instructions from the board, you know, risk uh, and compliance uh, advice. Let's just spool on down and get rid of a couple more kind of misconceptions here. Um, generally speaking, econometric measures are not the most useful way of dealing with uh, behavioral risk questions. They tend to ignore, uh, so I'm going to ahead of myself slightly, uh, they tend to ignore biases, uh, tribal effects, you know, the fact that traders want to talk to each other more than they want to talk to compliance. Um, and they also tend to give us a false sense that big data will answer all of the behavioral questions. It will answer some of them, but it won't uh, set an ethical tone for you in the same way as a proper program of behavioral risk management will. Finally then, looking at risk culture, we need to concern ourselves with a couple of much more reliable measures. Um, skewed structure. So if, you're, if your reward system uh, simply gives people cash for shifting quantities of product, that is not the best indicator of good behavior. It looks at uh, you know, outputs, if you like, raw outputs rather than happy customer outcomes, which is what we really want to know about. Um, I'd encourage you then to apply the, the what actually happens test to your reward systems. Look at the gaps between the published rules and the real behavior of, of traders and salespeople. Um, look at the opportunities they have and perhaps exploit for gaming the targets. Uh, this phrase that the colleagues at the LSE came up with, what's measured is what matters. You know, playing to the indicator rather than playing to the spirit of the control. Uh, and you can only achieve this really by studying what people are really doing out in the trading space. So, now, we promised to talk a little bit about the hotspots. Let's go and address that question next. Uh, so in the current year and the year ahead, so let's uh, quickly review where the pressure points are in the current year. So um, just to remind you, please pose your questions um, as we go along, and then we'll have an opportunity perhaps to answer some of them. Um, so things at the moment that the regulator seems particularly focused on is the corporate governance and control, and, and that's not altogether surprising, and that involves the board and, and the work of the role of the executive directors, non-exec directors, independents, all part of the SMR regime as well as senior management regime. How effective um, are the boards? A number of the boards have been asked to give attestations in various parts of their industry, and uh, one has to be very confident in giving a personal or a board attestation, um, because if then uh, there's a review um, and you're found wanting, it's 
not the place to be in. Well, we, we've heard a number of cases, and I know this is not just anecdotal, it's quite a trend, where an, an attestation request is followed by section 166, you know, as it were, uh, calling their bluff to prove it. Right. Uh, and, and interestingly, I think, you know, as I, I've been quite involved, as many of you know, with the introduction of this individual accountability regime, and I think one of, one of the selling points in the early days of the regime by the FCA and the PRA to the industry was that this um, regime will reduce the need for attestations. I'm not sure if that's happening, but I'm quite sure there is going to be an increase in internal attestations so senior managers can make themselves confident that what they've signed up for is being done properly. I'm sure that's right. Yes, and it, it, it is a sobering thought when you sign a, a responsibility statement and <clears throat> bearing in mind that the it is inescapable personal responsibility, so not to be taken lightly. The control frameworks and, and the committee structures uh, are all important. Oversight of the, and the first line of defence uh, um, is important. So the three lines of defence being line one, obviously, conformance and rigour and quality assurance in the business. Second line, risk, compliance, sometimes legal, finance. Third line is audit. The second line has to be independently minded. The third line has to be independent. Uh, I know the regulator will be looking in some of those spaces. Uh, uh, the outsourcing again, because if you're going to do material outsourcing, it's best to go to the regulator with before you sign a contract and be prepared to answer quite a number of testing questions. The um, governance control uh, is very important. The whole cyber risk is in increasing massively. Part of that is to an information security strength or weakness. Somebody once said there's two types of firm, those that have been hacked and those that haven't been hacked yet. So, um, I think the idea is there's no answer risk, you know, so those who have no answer when the regulator says, what precautions did you take? Yes. Because that's like, you know, wait to be hacked, so it is not an answer. I think the regulator will be looking long and hard at inf information security. Yes. And indeed, you'll know that uh, there's a particular prescribed function of the senior managers regime, which is about reducing the firm's uh, uh, propensity to be um, subject to financial crime. Yes, absolutely. On, on, on the uh, product side, not, look at new products, variations, and legacy products. Don't just look only at the um, new ones. And, and, and in doing so, start with the customer need and then identify the target market and work backwards, not the other way around. But we can produce this, we've got the ability to produce this, we think it will serve and make a lot of money. And the test is customer detriment at this point. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think particularly when, as inevitably is the case, people think that, oh, this is a good product for that particular uh, customer segment, let's see if we can broaden it out and sell yes. it to some other customer types. You really need to understand the risks. In, uh, yeah, the old idea is that push marketing rather than demand led. Yes. 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 And, and with the uh, mortgage market review uh, and mortgage credit directive, Obviously, mortgages will be under the spotlight, particularly around responsible lending and customer affordability. Let's look ahead then at next year and our predictions for where this is all going to, to take a uh, prosecution trail for the next 12 to 18 months. So, largely flows from where we were um, a moment ago talking about the today. We know that uh, ASIC talks to the FCA, we know that the SEC talks to the FCA, and so on. Um, it is perfectly reasonable to expect that um, the next generation of conduct offences will have um, analogous uh, offences in each of the different jurisdictions. And I think that may well be a benefit to our, uh, our members. I don't know what you think about that because we were talking about conduct risk earlier on and it's also about different uh, supervisors, different regulators. Uh, uh, appetite around the world to prosecute, to enforce for uh, conduct risk uh, failings. And I think we'd rather have one perspective of what that looks like rather than a, a multiplicity of them. Indeed. Some of these tools are analytical, uh, which, which we will talk about in a moment. Some of them are sort of technology-led. Um, a gentleman demonstrated to me recently a fantastic item which allows you to listen to all the tapes of all your traders and isolate the 5% of the conversations they're having which might be suspicious, thereby saving you, uh, you know, 95% of the time you might have otherwise had to spend chasing irrelevant uh, transaction data. Um, some of this, though, uh, that all sounds like a plan. Some of it, of course, is not a plan at all. It's actually rather more, shall we say, situational. Uh, and, and Trevor, maybe you'd just like to give, give us a quick word on 
what I'm going to call the time bombs, if we yes. can call them that. So equity release is on the increase, and of course it is a particularly high-risk area. We've had troubles in the past with it. Um, it. It can suit people very well, um, and there may be more demand for that um, as people move into retirement if they haven't got the funds available to clear their interest-only mortgage. The interest-only mortgage is an interesting story in some right, in a way, in that it was originally um, marketed on the basis that there was real evidence of the ability to repay the capital um, at, a, at a prescribed time. It then became an affordability tool for first-time buyers, and I don't think it was ever designed to do that. So I worry about those that will find that at the end of the term that they have no capital to... Yeah, I mean, a, a lot of these products are start in one place and then end up in another yeah. accidentally, and Absolutely. I think the regulator quite reasonably is asking, you know, beginning to ask. My concern is that some of these things might... Uh, let's call it the time bomb detonating, yes. you know, that the market might start to wobble, which then compromises the regulator's uh, engagement with, uh, you know, what is essentially uh, an accident waiting to happen in some cases. Yes. So whether the markets themselves get to this before the regulator or something more catastrophic... Well, interestingly, Trevor, and, uh, Roger, you've reminded <laughs> me, I've just got a piece of paper from my mortgage provider <laughs> asking how am I going to pay off my interest rate only mortgage. I've, I've got plans to do that, but of course my provider needs to understand what my, what my plans Indeed. are. Yes. Those, those of us of a certain age Simon, yes, indeed, it's, it's an issue. Let's um, get on then to questions about good behaviour, talking of, you know, or everyone trying to do the right thing, what might that look like? Um, we're often asked, you know, these are all fine words, but the regulator resists defining good behaviour, perhaps the good reason that they would like the industry to show some examples of it, which can then be approved. Um, so let's just talk about uh, what good behaviour might look like were we to have to make a, a, a list of... Uh, good things. I think the first point is, before you make that list, just to stand back a little bit and reconsider your attitude to, to how you're gathering the data. So the first point is to adjust your own vision and learn to see and respond to, to this dynamic thing that is called customer expectation. You know, what people want from you is changing all the time. Uh, as they age, as they change jobs, as their lifestyle, uh, you know, their, their family circumstances change. Think, for example, when people have children or when people move house or when they move job, you know, a lot of the risks that they took for granted before they reassess and they look again at their needs. So their expectation is a constantly moving target. And if you're not uh, tuning into that and, and checking it, um, you're likely to, to get into difficulty. The regulator is also very attuned to that set of concerns now. I think in addition to reading and understanding publications of the regulators, one should also have a dialogue with the ombudsman. Because this is where the regulators are getting their own. Yes, the yes. groups themselves, uh, which, um, uh, and other institutions. But, uh, and have a close and continuous dialogue. Um, I know that's old language, but uh, work closely with your regulator. And this extends to your understanding of the customer's view and how the regulator regards that, I guess. Absolutely. Um, and also have set up conversations um, and forums for your customers and listen to your customers. Um, certainly one would expect the board to know very well, very clearly, and having heard firsthand from the customers, you know, what do they think of the service, the value, the offerings, uh, and so on. So, and we're with open yeah. questions, well, not, not simply saying, are you satisfied, please tick, tick box for yes, you know, sort of classic yes. approach. For, for proper, active listening. Yes, real questions. And, and I think, too, the importance of monitoring social media. A friend of mine uh, works in uh, pharma and medical devices, and she says that uh, some of her clients have whole m social media rooms that track what people are saying about different Indeed. products and in fact, real one of, time. One of the analytics that we might have a moment to look at later, which we're, we're working on, uh, tunes into social media conversations around specific products and brands, uh, you know, as a way of getting you ahead of whether there's a bit of a, a, you know, a balloon building up in that space that's about to pop. Um, it's so got to be consistent. I mean, the term from the top piece, key, key to the culture of the organization, um, but it has to be authentic. So. Fine words are not enough. The, the, the actions that follow it and, and the rewards and servicing of, of, of individuals. Uh, incentive schemes uh, in the past that have been uh, related only to sales, yes. with overrides, uh, have been disastrous. 
I think not surprisingly, you don't have to be a behavioural analyst to realise this, you know, that if a salesperson is, is told you can either be ethical or you can make your target, very often they'll go with the target. Yes. And the question then is, so why was the target designed in that way? So we, we should reconsider the target and look more at rewarding a good customer experience so. than simply shipping the numbers. Uh, what I call risk-aware working, and I, I think one of the very, again, simple behavioural ideas we can bring in here, you don't need to be sort of highly qualified to, to talk about this, is allowing people to use their intuition. Uh, a colleague of mine in the research field introduced a, a, an NHS thing called the Friends and Family Test, which is, you know, encouraging junior staff in the health service to share experiences with each other based on how they would explain it to, to non-experts, you know, to family members rather than as a sort of formal risk assessment. It's incredibly effective at, at opening up the dialogue around, you know, concerns around products and services, rather than getting people to be overly analytical. Um, with Christmas coming, I thought we'd just show a few sort of good behavioural goodies. Uh, these are all things which you can do, which you can show the regulator, which we believe will keep them happy in a way which perhaps uh, they're, they're feeling they're underserviced at the moment. So improving your customer understanding, which uh, Trevor was just talking about. Independent audit of customer experience, so in other words, not using your own people to ask them, but using an external uh, agency. And also making sure that you reward the researchers in a way which doesn't uh, you know, overly encourage them to find positive answers. Uh, so research structure, very important. Designing customer-centric products, this idea of uh, not so much uh, funding up and pushing out the product, but allowing customer needs to dictate product uh, structuring. And finally, a bit of investing in bias awareness. So I would encourage everyone to perhaps invest a little bit of time in reading some of the textbooks and the uh, behavioral uh, monographs that the regulator are themselves reading. Uh, if you look at the resources we've attached at the end of this uh, presentation, you can see that we've done some of the reading for you to, to give you a quick guide to uh, the stuff that is influencing the regulator uh, and their current thinking. Um, I said we'd show you one or two bits of work in progress on the way through. This thing is called the Behavioral Risk Detector, and it is a non-econometric tool which allows us to get ahead of, are we upsetting the customers? Uh, time is a little short for fully explaining it now, but it's a, it's a fairly plain language approach to uh, not causing customer detriment. Uh, the point is it doesn't use econometrics, it uses behavior-based questioning. I think now we're going to uh, ask you the second question, which links into the individual accountability regime, the senior manager's regime, and it's around statements of responsibility. Do you remember that uh, everybody who accepts a prescribed responsibility has to uh, sign off on a statement of responsibility? Now, our question here is, do those statements of responsibility include, uh, include conduct risk governance? A, yes and all those statements of responsibility agreed, uh, B, you're still working on it, C, not sure, or D, no. A few minutes, a few seconds to uh, put in your responses to that, uh, that question. Do your statements of responsibility include conduct risk governance? We're just getting the, uh, the uh, results up now. And the, Almost half of you say you're still working on it. And I think that's understandable. You'll be going to your boards, I guess, any minute now with those statements of responsibility, with your uh, uh, responsibility maps in preparation for uploading them into the Connect system so that you're ready for the uh, 7th, of, uh, the 7th of, of March. I'm quite encouraged to see that there are no no answers there, which is good. So everyone is at least uh, a work in progress, if not actually signed off. Let's now look at the cost planning question because this notion of uh, you know, return on compliance spend is uppermost in, in the minds of many a finance director uh, given the ratcheting up of, of prosecution costs and the staffing to, to try and preempt some of that. It's most certainly an increasing cost. I don't think anyone would deny that. Yes. Yes, for all financial institutions. The, the cost of compliance is going up for sure, but the cost of non-compliance is much greater. Yeah. I think this is always the point, and I'll show a, a little board education tool in a second which just unpacks some of this stuff about just making quite clear again in let's call it risk governance terms that there is an enterprise cost to non-compliance. Um, I won't dwell on this now, we'll do it in the next uh, slide, but uh, the point is it's about learning, equipping people to understand, let's call it in accounting terms, the opportunity cost of non-compliance. Uh, 
uh, versus the savings of compliance. The benefits of compliance are always now greater given the cost of fines uh, having gone up uh, than the, the so-called benefits of gaming the system. So, uh, Trevor, there's a, huge, there's a culture point there, I think, as well. Here. Most definitely there is. Um, and it, it comes back to um, employing the right people um, and sharing with them the right values and the culture and keeping it very joined up in that regard. I think in terms of technical skills, um, in, in compliance, I've, having interviewed many over the years, um, I would avoid the pulpit preacher or the frustrated policeman. I, I, I want somebody who thinks like a business person or is connected with the business, prepared to do business, um, but in a particular way, in the right way. So I don't think compliance officers should be like traffic wardens either and say, no, you can't, no, you can't. I'd rather they said, okay, if we want to do this, let's do it this way. It's a, it's a tone of voice, isn't it? It's engagement. It, it, it is engagement um, and uh, empowerment too. Indeed. Uh, a part of that empowerment is allowing uh, other staff to have conversations, uh, as we said earlier, using their intuition, yes. sort of, you know, express concern about something, but not in a formal tick box kind of risk reporting way, just to say, I think it might be good if we considered, you know, a possible weakness here and, and trying to get it. I think we've got that opportunity as we plan for the training that we're going to have to introduce around the rules of conduct, which come into effect for everybody in a bank. Um, by, uh, I think it's September 2017. That's the point at which you can have that engagement and conversation, I think. Quite so. But you need to be planning for that now. And to do it, you know, to, in try to ask open questions rather than sort of, uh, you know, closed questions to which the answer is only yes or no, you know, it allow people to uh, express a concern rather than simply to answer a, a direct challenge. Um, I promised we'd show you a little bit of work in progress on sort of predictive tools and some of the stuff that the regulators are themselves now using. Uh, partly with our help, I have to say. Um, here's an analysis which looks at uh, fines. Like said, we've deliberately blurred it. Please don't worry that you can't read it. That's because the data is uh, copyright protected. We're looking at um, how fines specifically impact business lines or individuals. So this is, uh, you know, very briefly just saying, uh, in a, within a retail banking business, each of the lines is a, is, uh, a line of business. The blue boxes indicate the number of fines that the regulator has issued against the business. The lines on the right-hand side indicate the cost of the fines against the business. So this gives you an indication of uh, volume by number and volume by cost impact. Uh, that's a fairly straightforward analytic. Excuse me, question. Um, Here's a little piece that we're using as part of our development with Cambridge University of the Conduct Compliance Academy. Uh, it's a very simple board piece which just lays out in the plainest possible terms the three types of cost impact. And my, everybody, of course, thinks about cash impact in terms of paying fines or funding clear-up costs after an incident. Uh, they think a little bit less, perhaps, about the fact that a really big fine can impact your tier one capital. Uh, and a number of uh, uh, providers, shall we say, have had conversations with us about that concern. I would tend to say, actually, look at the third box, the one which people tend to forget about, and that is that your shareholders might wake up one morning and decide that, as a board of directors, you're not competent to manage the business anymore, and they're going to challenge that and re you know, install an alternative government. Um, you might, of course, lose your license directly through a regulator's intervention. That's another type of loss of control. But the biggest thing, really, is the governance challenge that says if there's a vote of no confidence in you and you know, your ability to deal with this conduct object, um, that could have very direct consequences on a board of management in ways that is, if you like, uh, civil governance rather than uh, criminal prosecution. It's an interesting um, feed in from one of our listeners. I like this very much. Um, the, the gentleman concerns says, we see compliance as the group's critical friend. That's I think a very a nice, nice phrase. It is. Yes, I like yes. that. So thank you for that. I'll, I'll use that myself going forward, if I may. <laughs> now, um, talking about tools, I've shown you a little bit of, uh, if you like, retrospective analysis. What about the forward-looking stuff? Well, we're involved very much in the space of developing. Uh, predictions of you know where conduct's going to bite and uh, the cost that, that relates. Them. I would say though, for all that you can talk about predictive analytics and, and using these sort of uh, analytical jargon, 
actually, in plain language, you, what you're looking to do is preempt customer abuse, you know, get ahead of situations in which, by accident or design, uh, you are causing customer detriment. So let's always try to translate this notion of conduct risk back to very simple terms of what people are doing to other people in the sales space, particularly. Um, and actually, just taking that point to, to start with, it's about observing what people are doing. Try to rely less on the sort of big data approach and actually go out, walk the floor, watch and see what's happening. Extend, as the regulator has done, extend your own sources of information. Talk to consumer groups and ombudsmen. Uh, have listening sessions with customers which give them the opportunity to voice their concerns freely. Apply that thing I mentioned a moment ago, the friends and family test. You know, encourage your staff to explain in plain language rather than risk analytics if they want to raise concerns. And of course, like any uh, provider, keep one eye through your law firm or whatever sort of bought-in intelligence service, uh, we can do that too, uh, on the regulatory pipeline of what's the next thing that's going to, or indeed the BBA, of course. Thank you very much. much. That's what, what they're there for. Um, so watch for what's coming next. Uh, there are, though, uh, some advanced methods which uh, analyze what might, hatch you, what might hit you. And I want to just share a little uh, set of examples of that. Um, not so much to sort of uh, say that this is what we do uh, the rest of the time when we're not doing webinars, but just to say there are alternative ways of thinking about this risk which may inform your understanding and particularly your cost planning for compliance uh, resources going forward. Um, so taxonomy, just a kind of posh word for sorting things out. Uh, if you look at conduct risk around the world as it's developing in those other jurisdictions, very clear that there are some common themes to those prosecutions, which I'll show you in a second. Uh, once you understand that there are common themes and you look at things like near-miss events as well as actual loss or large loss events, you can heat map and create, uh, you can back derive from that algorithms which show the common factors and risk clusters which uh, point to your greatest uh, types of exposure. Behavioral risk as a cluster is unfamiliar to a lot of people who are brought up on sort of uh, market risk and op risk. Uh, and therefore we need a bit of a new approach to that because it's a scalar thing. It is not a, a financial type indicator. It's a rather more subtle set of uh, interactions. So let's just take a quick look at a couple of those to, to give you a sense of how that might play out in the analysis space. Um, here's a metric uh, produced by our uh, colleagues in Dublin, which again, I'm sorry, we've blurred it a little. It's deliberately just to give you a sense of the shape of the information rather than specific content. Um, the red lines are showing where criminal charges have been brought. So in each of the years 2013, 14, 15, uh, at the top of the chart, the red content is the quantum of criminal charges which is brought rather than uh, civil charges for non-performance of a regulated duty. And what is apparent is that 2015, just to be clear, this is first half year data. I appreciate it's December now, but this was uh, compiled uh, back in uh, September time. So looking at just calendar months, uh, January to June, on that reading alone, the quantum of criminal charges, that is the amount of, uh, if you like, uh, risk that you personally might end up in prison, uh, is increasing. Uh, here's another more sort of holistic view of the same thing, and this is the taxonomy. This is the idea that you can shape a number of universal categories of regulatory failure. So you can look at, as it were, the SEC approach or the European Commission approach or split it down by sort of jurisdictions which are already getting into conduct risk, whether that's the UK, Singapore, Australia, wherever. Um, and you can discern that there are broadly six categories of regulatory failure in the conduct space. Market fraud, economic crime, uh, conduct obligations, regulatory obligations, oversight, systems and controls. Now, every type of conduct prosecution fits within one of those six categories globally, just to be clear. So what you can do is back derive from that a heat map which says if you're in a certain product line in a certain jurisdiction, regulated space, here is your liability for, you know, the, the likelihood of your being prosecuted for a specific offence or officer exposure. Uh, I'd love to go into more detail on that because it's a fascinating piece of work. Uh, sadly, time is pressing a little. Let's just briefly wrap up then on managing conduct risk uh, before we ask you a final question. Uh, Trevor, perhaps you'd like to... Yes, I, I think it's a, it's a question to ask oneself. So, looking at your organisation, um, how embedded in, in the culture now is conduct risk? 
And one of the things that's helpful to do as a technical piece is to create a conduct risk universe where you discern all the inherent risks and then set against them your protective uh, controls, your preventive controls, and then your def defensive controls, detecting. Obviously, detection is important in terms of its ability to detect and do it in a timely manner. But then that will give you a net residual risk exposure. And these are conventional tools, they are imagine, conventional but they're tools. answering the question then, we're putting here about the customer view. Then examining that net residual position, you can ask yourself whether you're comfortable with it or not. And then, of course, findings from audits and compliance monitoring and op risk incidents and breaches and that can be set against that particular line. Um, and then from that, you can derive a decent uh, heat map um, that, that one can understand and help the executive with their line of sight. So I think, I think that's particularly important. But make customer value and service a success criteria. Um, and obviously make sure that um, alongside that you can support it by um, very sound controls that are fully joined up um, from, uh, from all aspects of your business. And it doesn't matter where in the world you're conducting it. Yes, it should be the same everywhere and it should be the same for every customer. Just to sort of pipe that back into the exposure of individual uh, risk officers and indeed board generally, mm -hmm. um, here's a quick analysis of fines by job function in the first half of 2015, actually end of 2013 to first half of 2015. Uh, again, we've blurred it to uh, to sort of hide the origin of the data a little, but um, just to, those categories are director, CEO, um, partner, head of compliance, and so on. And these are showing the individual fines against UK-based uh, conduct task directors. Yeah, and I think here, obviously, it's important that individuals are right-minded uh, and, and um, not criminals. Fine. Some of those may have been wrong-minded. You can be very right-minded. However, you still have to be able to evidence you've taken all the right steps to avoid customer detriment or damage to your organisation or the industry. So one has to be very uh, vigilant. Um, and it's, it's not enough to say, well, I was only one of ten in the committee that thought it was a good idea. Indeed. Um, we were challenged, uh, Simon, by you and your colleagues Indeed. to reduce, the reduce this to the top seven steps. So in the interest of, uh, of uh, full transparency and also delivering on promise, let us give you the seven steps. Clearly there are, just to say, uh, there are more than seven things you can do, but here are seven things that perhaps uh, would be a very good starting point for keeping the regulator happy and you know, keeping ahead of expectations, shall we say. So we'll just whistle through these uh, one by one. Trevor? Yes, well, the, the first one is to do with um, a practical compliance piece of the board and senior management and, and hands-on. So, as your slide will reveal, it's largely about responsibilities and apportionment, uh, competence and fitness and properness, and then after that one would have the controls. And hopefully you're already doing that, obviously with SMR just around the corner, we're about to be hit by a truck if we're not doing that. Um, customer view and independently, this thing about finding out uh, from a third party source, you know, from an independent observer, what the customers accept and what they expect. This is really the root of behavioural risk management. It's not sort of, as it were, saying to yourself, looking in the mirror in the morning, I'm feeling rather ethical today, so that's all right. It's actually getting outside the organisation and not sort of leaning on your own resources too much. And what are the sort of tools that we can use to, uh, to do that? It's, well, actually, it's, it's more than customer satisfaction questionnaires, it's focus groups. It is. It's kind of it's focus groups, but led by people who are not you. <laughs> uh, it's also mystery shopping, which, of course, a lot of the big retail brands already do, but you know, it needs to become a much more common practice. Uh, and it's actually inviting people who are both customers and not customers, and perhaps in some cases ex-customers, mm -hmm. you know, so rather as you do a... Um, you know, if a member of your staff is leaving, you would do an exit interview with them. You know, do we do exit interviews with customers who've gone? I suspect that, you know, most organisations don't bother with that very much. Um, and all of this, of course, informs the regulator. You have to think about three sources of information that the regulator themselves using. So behavioural risk reading, 
Uh, again, do please look at the papers that we've attached to this, which talk about some background on behavioural research and sort of digesting some of that. The customer end experience, which means not just customers, but customer representatives like ombudsmen, consumer groups and so on. Um, and this idea of the global dialogue around conduct regulation. You know, if you've not read, for example, ASIC in Australia, they just published a manifesto for conduct risk regulation. Pretty aggressive, you know, worth a look if you want to see where this is going. Uh, product design is, is very much part of this. And I would say if you want a quick indicator for good conduct in product design, how early do you involve risk managers in product design? Early is good, late or not at all is bad behaviour. Uh, perhaps more to the point, customer benefit that, that comes out of that. Uh, within uh, not so much product design but sales space, you know, setting the incentive so that you're rewarding uh, customer experience. You know, good experience, good incentive. And again, uh, a mechanism, ignoring experience, not so good. <laughs> and again, a mechanism to do that, if you're not doing it already, is the, um, the senior manager prescribed responsibility in re relation to the design of remuneration uh, processes. Indeed. Um, Trevor, I think there's another thing here on staffing and, and quality there. Yes, again, it, 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 that's much the same in, in that um, got to engage people. They do, typically, people do three things. What's important to their boss, how they're remunerated, and what they like doing. <laughs> so two of those three are in the workplace, particularly. Um, so ensure that when you set up the incentivization regimes, whatever they are, that they're driving the right behaviours and not the wrong ones. I find this, this idea I've banged on about a lot, but it, it matters. You know, allow people to use their intuition. Very often regulatory schemes and control schemes kind of suppress common sense. You know, opening up a dialogue which allows people to express concern about something without it necessarily saying you're in the regulated space. You know, just talk about stuff. It really helps. And, and we're, so we're talking absolutely. We're talking more than whistleblowing here. Wh whistleblowing, oh, yeah, no, whistleblowing is almost like a last, a last resort. Yeah. You know, it shouldn't get to whistleblowing if you're having good sort of intuitive uh, conversations with customer-facing people. You know, if their sense of it is it's not working, encourage them to reflect on why that is and what you can do about it. All of which then contributes to your own forward view. Uh, again, just to remind you, the regulator is acquiring all the same sort of information. You know, horizon scanning, causal analysis, some of these tools that we've just flashed up on the screen, they are using all the same stuff, you know. Definitely got to avoid a good news culture, where the only thing that goes up the line is good news. Absolutely, you know, be, um, if there's an overall lesson, be more reflective, yes, more willing to consider, you know, shades of behaviour yeah, rather than nice absolutes. Also, when you can agree with someone, and if they're senior to you, you're probably more inclined to want to agree with them, <laughs> but they should welcome your challenge, otherwise we get the Emperor's new clothes. Yes. So let's wind up, and, and Simon, please, uh, back to our host. We'd like to ask you a final question uh, to perhaps reflect on what we've been discussing. Good. So I, I think now we're at the stage of wondering where we take this forward. So we'll have this available for you uh, so you can review it. it, it we'll, we'll send you the recording of it. We've had some questions come in. Do uh, ask us uh, questions over the course of, of the day after you've reviewed the, um, uh, the, the playback. Uh, and, and do think, too, about how it is that we could be most helpful to you. So a, a, a final question, is it a, a, broad, a board briefing on conduct risk? Is it uh, practical tools for conduct compliance? Is it practical tools to manage the cost of compliance? Uh, what are the compliance hotspots in terms of uh, UK enforcement? How do we construct a, a heat map of uh, the, the liabilities around conduct enforcement. So we've given you five choices there. And, and do click on any that, uh, that you think apply to you. So please do that now. Again, broadly uh, based, but uh, focusing very much, I think, on, uh, on conduct uh, compliance getting on with some practical tools that we can use to uh, metric how compliant we're being in the uh, conduct space. Trevor, Roger, any final wrap-up thoughts from you guys? I, I'm particularly interested in, the, uh, in the, the, the pie chart that I'm looking at now where conduct uh, risk and compliance is still very much an appetite for it. People want to understand it and I must say, having been in the business for many years, 
yeah, it's important you understand it. Yeah. Absolutely vital. Uh, I would never want to see anyone lose um, the, the, the license to, to trade in our industry. I would say from the behavioural side, although people are a little bit nervous about behaviour or they feel that perhaps there's this sort of trendy political object called nudging or something, but uh, I, I just sort of recall people's attention to, to a thing called TCF, you know, treating customers fairly, which actually, although perhaps surprised some of us in the industry at the time that we had to be asked to treat customers fairly, not a bad point to start and, you know, to build out from that in terms of asking people practical stuff, of, you know, observing directly how people engage in selling spaces and what the customers are, are responding, you know, to those engagements and report as frankly as you can on that and try and get away from sort of putting too much metrics around it and simply talk about the experience that, that people have. Well, we will of course address and answer the questions that have been posed. We will get back to all of you in that regard in a timely manner as you'd expect. And indeed where available you'll see uh, online there's a, a, a connection point if you want to raise any questions with any of us here directly uh, in the follow through. Very happy to deal with that. Thank you, Simon. Good. Thank you for Thank the opportunity. You. Thank you very much indeed, well. everybody, uh, for joining us. And we will make sure, as Simon has just said, that this will be pushed out to you as an on-demand PDF version of the web um, of the slides, um, as well as any questions. Please download the resources uh, that Berkeley Research Group has made available to us. And I'd just like to thank um, our, our presenters, um, Simon, Trevor, and, and, and Roger, um, for their time today. And yes, have a great day. Thank you.